I welcome today and I am honored to introduce my colleague, Alan Lohr, who agreed to share with us his knowledge and expertise on guns, armaments, and other scary things from the Civil War period. So without any more, Alan Lohr. Thank you. I wish all my lectures started out like that, but uh, that's very nice. We should have one coming up. That was just kind of a cover thing I've got up while I babble a little bit. This is a pretty general lecture. Uh, didn't quite know where to go, so if you're an expert in Civil War, this will probably be very boring for you. Um, if not, then there's a lot of good information in here. Um, what good it is, I'm not sure, but it'll be interesting nonetheless. Um, it probably won't make you a dollar, but that's uh, where we're going to go. And we're going to start out with gunpowder, and we're going to go into a little bit of statistics. Um, the projectiles, so propellants, projectiles, and the arms that they were used in. And that's the order in which we're going to go through our slideshow. So we'll get started on the first one. This is pretty typical of what we would see. Um, the cannon crew, their union. So um, that was that was the, the uh, conditions. And they're even posing. OK, we'll start with powder. Back then, there was no smokeless powder. Everything was black. And they all just called it gunpowder. Um, what do you want? Gunpowder. It was just one gunpowder. Um, the composition of gunpowder back then, or black powder, is charcoal, sulfur, and potassium nitrate, also known as saltpeter. But that's what uh, black powder is made out of. And it came from the ninth century in China, were the first people that did that. Um, when you fire that stuff, it makes a big white smoke cloud. So when you think of tens of thousands of rounds being fired, it makes a pretty good plume of white smoke. It makes hitting your target a little rough. The gunpowder these days doesn't make smoke. Hence the name smokeless. Um, burn rate. Different size kernels for different caliber gun. Small kernels, small gun. Big kernels, about the size of golf balls for cannon. The big kernels, the big, the big balls of powder burn slower. The small powder has more surface area, hence it burns faster. And that's how they determine that. Now, it's, it's graded. When they make this stuff, they grind it up and it goes through a sieve and it gets graded by size. 1F, 2F, 3F, and the more Fs, the finer the powder is, and they use that for priming, etc. It's more of a flash than a, a slow burn. Okay, so um, production back then, uh, DuPont up north, DuPont is still around these days. Um, they still make powder, they still make all kinds of explosives and things. Uh, they were in Delaware. And the South had Confederate Powder Works in Augusta, Georgia. That was probably the most modern powder plant in existence at that time. They started steaming the powder, they upped their production, and they made a lot of it. And it was a very good, it was a very good plant. The smokestack still stands in Augusta. So if you ever get down to Georgia, um, their chimney still stands. It's a pretty good plant. They left that uh, after the war. Uh, to just put smokeless in, it did not exist during the Civil War. But um, the single base is just pure nitrocellulose, and that, which is gun paper, gun cotton. And the double base has nitroglycerin mixed in with it. And that's the, uh, the powders of today, just for comparison. Okay. Some statistics. I like numbers, so this was very interesting to me. Um, when the war started, the North really had nothing to play with. They had no guns, they had no ammo, they had very little of anything. Um, 395,000 small arms, 10,000 of which were in the common caliber. They, it was a miscellaneous of everything. Different calibers, different ammo, it made getting stuff to the troops very difficult. So in reality, it had 10,000 good working guns in a standard uh, caliber. Uh, 16.5 million rounds of ammunition of all various sizes and shapes, and 64,000 rounds for the artillery. Again, different sizes, different shapes, kind of thing. Um, but they knew there was a problem. So by February of 63, 137 million rounds of ammunition. They had kicked it in the butt, and they got her going. Okay? The North had great manufacturing capability. 
It took 55 million pounds of lead to make the, that ammunition. Which brings us to another story. How in the world, back in the 1860s, do you move things around? You have three ways of moving stuff around. You have a ship, you have a train, and you have a team of horses or mules. Think about moving 55 million tons, or yeah, 55 million pounds of stuff around without a truck, without a tractor, with nothing. <laughs> it brings a whole, a whole new look on things. Okay. Um, by the end of the year in '63, they had bumped up their ammunition or their arms as well. Um, 1.3 million small arms and 259 million rounds. They kept it going. 1,500 pieces of artillery and a million, a little million rounds of ammo for the artillery. And another 48 million pounds of lead and 6 million pounds of powder. That's a lot of powder. It's just amazing. How, and, and how do you accomplish this? I don't know. The total price, just an ordinance. $42 million in 1863, and it averaged that for the next two years, or 64, 65. So the average for the cost just in ammo, guns, it didn't include food, didn't include harnesses for their mules, didn't include any of that. $42 million, $40 million a year. Yeah. The average gun cost 15 bucks back then, now it's 1500 So now you could probably add a couple more zeros to that and you'd put you right in there on inflation. Okay, so a lot of money. Um, that was for the North. Federal Army, that's North. Now we're going to go to the South. The South had more arms to start with because when the war started, the North had arms stored in the South. And when it started, they confiscated them. They go, they're here, they're ours now. <laughs> so they got uh, quite, a few, quite a few guns from the north because they were stored in the south. Uh, this is for the whole war, July of 61 to January of 65. Um, 363 small arms, that would include rifles, pistols, and carbines, and 72 million rounds. 1,600 pieces of artillery or cannons, and 921,000 rounds for those. This is just a statistic that I thought interesting about the war. 500 pounds of lead or steel was fired for every casualty. And 200 pounds were fired for everybody that was wounded, which they said, ah, it takes your body weight in lead to get you, which is pretty darn close, okay? 200 pounds, pretty close. Um, just so you get to know what I'm talking about, if I say muzzle loader or breech loader or side lock or that, I'd put a little exploded view up here. Um, I yell a little louder. Right out here at the end is the muzzle. So if it's a muzzle loader, you load the front of that end with a ramrod, like an old school black powder gun. Back here, if I use my button, back here is the breech. Now this is the muzzle loader, so it has a breech. There's the part of a lock. Uh, we have our hammer. We've got a mainspring, which forces the hammer forward. And down in there is a sear. And the back, oops, <laughs> back up here. Um, in the back, it says sear. That's what your actual trigger bow or trigger shoe contacts. So when that piece comes off, the trigger doesn't really do anything. It bumps against that sear. And uh, they're still using these on, high, on expensive double barrel shotguns except that the hammer is internal. This is an external hammer side lock. 
there's a real picture of one with all of the parts inside. That little notch up at the top, right in front of the hammer, so it goes around the nipple. You'll see that in the next picture. There's your side lock with a hammer on an 1861 Springfield. And up there in the front, there's a nipple and a hole that goes into the barrel. That's where that little notch in the lock goes around. That's an authentic gun. Notice the pitting. Okay, percussion cap. Back then, they didn't have primers. This is what they had. We were beyond the flintlock days where you strike a, a stone against a, a, a piece of steel to make a spark. Now you have a contained, basically a primer, an early primer, and that slid over that little nipple right there. Ah, does that look familiar? <laughs> we got a little James Bond going on here. That's a rifled barrel. That's looking from the inside of a barrel, and those twists are actually rifling, and that's what makes the bullet spin. Um, it was invented in Germany in the 15th century, about 1480, actually, in Augsburg, and then it moved to Nuremberg. It never hit the states real hard until the 19th century. In fact, the Civil War started out using muskets, which are smoothbore guns, like a shotgun. No rifling, no twist, just like a shotgun barrel. But this is rifling. Um, it actually spins the bullet. Why do we spin the bullet? Things like to fly heavy end first. And when you put a point on a projectile to bust the wind better, it becomes heavy in the back. So now what it wants to do is it wants to flip ends to try and make the heavy end go first. We don't want that. When it starts to tumble, that makes the aerodynamics pretty poor. So we need to keep the point headed that way, toward the other guy. By spinning it, it's like a gyroscope or a top. It keeps it going, and it keeps the light end going forward. Okay. Um, twist rate is determined by the length of the bullet. The longer the bullet, the faster the twist. A ball takes very little twist because it's not very long. So a ball takes like a one twist in 36 inches, where if you have a longer projectile, it can be one, one turn in 10 inches pretty fast. Your, your average elk gun, deer gun, one turn in 10 inches, okay, because the bullets are relatively long, okay. Um, any ideas how fast a bullet might be spinning RPM-wise? It's a lot. 240,000 RPM. Think about your car. What's red line, 6,000? It's coasting. It ain't even started good yet. So a car spinning 6,000 RPM when you shift has nothing on a bullet. A bullet's 240,000 revolutions a minute. 4,000 feet a second, one twist in a foot, comes up 240,000. That's zinging it. Okay, so well, that's why we're spinning bullets. Longer, we've gone to pointed bullets, and it gets after it. It needs spin, called oh, twist rate. Here is the mini ball. This is the one that destroyed an awful lot of people in the Civil War. Um, it's a 58 caliber. It's pointed in the front. It's hollow in the back. The reason it's hollow in the back is to kind of keep a little bit of weight forward, and the biggest reason it's hollow in the back is it's the same size as the bore, so it's easy to load from a muzzle end. So when you take your ramrod and jam it down in there, it loads relatively easily. You're not trying to pound it past the rifling. It goes in easier. When you light it, touch the round off, when you light your powder, the bottom flares and seals the, seals the bore. So you put that cone full of pressure, it expands, it seals the bore, it catches the rifling, and it spins out of the end. Okay, so that's why it's hollow. Fast loading and pointed, and it, uh, it flares out and seals up. It's compared to a 45 ACP for those of you that shoot handgun. That's a 45 auto next to it for size. You'll see them tearing the cartridges off in the movie. Tear the paper off. 
pour the powder down the barrel, and ram the mini ball in from the top. These were packed this way by women in the, in the uh, arsenals. Um, they'd put the ball in, they'd put the powder in, and they'd wrap them up in a piece of paper. Um, and they came 10 to a pack and 12 caps or 12 percussion caps in case you wanted to clear your weapon or um, you lost one in the heat of battle. <laughs> you need a few extra primers, don't want to drop them. So that's how they came, and that's what's in these paper cartridges. And there's an example of them. The first one, pretty typical. The second one is worth noting. That is a Whitworth hex. That has a hex bullet in it, and it's in the shape of a hexagon. The next one has probably a ball and some buckshot in the end. The third one, it says inert on it. But the one on the far right, that's for handgun. And uh, those were made out of normally paper, but they also started making them out of uh, nitrated linen or even animal gut. The one on the far right, sometimes those were made out of animal gut with nitrate in them. Okay. But that's what you got to load your gun with. So they'd bite the end off, pour the powder in, and then ram the, uh, the bullet in behind it. You'll see that happen in a movie. The Whitworth projectile, it's a hex. And it's, uh, it's for a specific gun, because it had a hex bore, and we'll find that later on in the pictures. Um, that was a pretty, a pretty accurate rifle back then. Then we move on a little bit later, and we find a pin fire. And uh, pin fires mostly in, in revolvers, but you hammer that little pin, and there's a, a priming compound in there that it lights, and then it lights the main charge. And the pin fire, that's, that's even before rim fires. But, uh, We'll have guns that we can apply to that later, but notice the pin on the side. There's an, a cutaway. The pin comes in, hits the priming compound, lights the big main charge, and then the bullet goes out of the end, called pin fire. Then we have rim fire. We all know what a 22 looks like. That's a rim fire. Same thing, just bigger. Uh, the components of this are the lead in the front, the case in the back, and that's the two. It's not a bullet. It's a cartridge. That's why cartridge on the top. Bullet, case, powder combined is a cartridge. Rim fire. The way they make these is they put a little priming compound and then they fold the metal over the back and when it's crushed it goes off. Just like your, your 22s of today. Okay. We're moving on and we are up to handguns. There's a couple parts we need to explain about handgun. Indeed, it does have a muzzle, but it's not loaded from there. We have a muzzle, but it's loaded in through the front of the cylinder. This lever right here comes down, that's a ramrod. So you load your powder in here, you load your bullet in there, and then you compress it by pulling down on the lever, and it packs your load in there. It's a six-shot revolver. It's a little better. This one goes with the Navy. Um, the only difference really is that it's a 36 caliber and it was issued to the guys in the Navy um, or whoever could find them. Keep in mind any of these guns that you see here, if they found them, they'd use them if they could get ammo for them. Um, the volunteers of the war brought whatever they could find. They'd use shotguns, anything, Kentucky squirrel rifles. They'd use anything they could find. It, it came, if it was there, they were ready to fight. They want to fight. They bring their gun. They used it. 
okay. So it kind of goes away. This one you can see pretty good, the, the uh, nipple and the percussion cap, hammer. This is the second most used gun, um, the Remington. This one was preferred. Notice the strap on the top. It's a little stronger. It's not open on the top. It's got a, a bridge across the top, okay, which is nice. The cylinder also came out easier, which made loading a, a little faster. It wasn't uncommon for guys to carry two guns. That gave them 12 rapid-fire shots in close battle. If you had two guns, you had 12 shots real quick. Worked pretty good. You could reload later. They did not reload fast. That was one thing. It was not a, not a speedy thing. Okay. So the 63 Remington new model, they had an old model that wasn't as nice. They kept upgrading it a little bit. But uh, again, a 44 caliber ball, it was, it was liked a lot. They used this one quite often. The star single action. The double action came first, and they tried that in, in, uh, in service, but it didn't work. It didn't hold up. It broke a lot. So they came out, star built a single action. And uh, this one was used a lot by the North, 44 caliber again, but pretty primitive compared to what we're used to looking at. But it was, it was a good gun. Colt Dragoon, cavalry like these, and they were for initially uh, made to shoot mounts out from under charging soldiers. So it's a big gun, big caliber, and it was meant to shoot horses and people and whatever else got in the way. This is a very clear picture of the nipple where you would put your percussion cap over the top. It has, it has a brass frame. They used a lot of brass, bronze back then. Makes them look cool. It's soft, but for black powder, you're not talking big, big uh, pressures. There's that double action star. Uh, the North hated it, hence they, they decided to go to the single action, but the uh, South, the South wrote raving reviews on this gun. It couldn't have been for the looks. It's, it's pretty, it's pretty, but they liked it. They said if they'd hit somebody at 100 yards with it, it did the job. So they were very happy with this. Double action means when you pull the trigger, it automatically cocks the hammer and lets it fly for you. Single action, you cock the hammer, you shoot it, you cock the hammer, you shoot it. This one, you can just keep squeezing the trigger and it will revolve the cylinder and it will cock the hammer and it will fire if it works. It was early on. It broke a lot. Okay. I don't know if I mentioned cylinder or not. The Lamont. Um, that was imported from France, 42 caliber and 16 gauge. Now, how in the heck does that work? Um, <laughs> it's a really good idea in principle, but it was kind of flimsy. It broke a lot. Um, if it worked well, it should be devastating. Uh, the guy came from, um, he was over in Mississippi, I believe. Don't quote me on that one, but he was down around, down in the south, and he was a Frenchman that lived down in that, that uh, neighborhood. He went back to France during the war to build more guns for the Confederacy, but this was one of his designs. He was a, he was a doctor, like Gatling. A lot of doctor gun designers for some reason. This is why it's 16 gauge. That's a neat gun, but it broke a lot, so it wasn't, the idea was good. There's another unique one. This was only made during the war. Um, very few numbers exist. The 1861 Savage Navy. Notice the little thumb 
the cocker in the bottom. This hole right here, you put your middle finger through, and it would rotate the cylinder, and it would cock the hammer, and then you could fire it. So it was kind of like a self-cocking pistol. You could squeeze it, it would cock, and then you could squeeze the top of the trigger, and it would fire. It's kind of a, it's kind of a unique design. But it only existed before the war, during the war. Um, it was never available commercially, and there wasn't many of them, but the cavalry um, like them. And you, and you can see the nipple for the suction cap, and he, and he did a black loading, or a black powder, most loading revolver. Funny looking hammer. But it's the way it cocked that makes it unique. Smaller caliber too, 36 caliber instead of 44. So those were common. La Fouche, La Fouche, I don't know, I just learned that word. I'm not a very good Frenchman. <laughs> I didn't write it. It's in my pocket. But anyway, if you can say that, that's who made it. Uh, another Frenchman. 12 millimeter pin fire. We know what pin fire looks like, we saw that earlier. And this is just an overall view. There's some pinfire ammunition down in that green box. It's a 12 millimeter, which is almost a half inch. It's a pretty big bullet. And there, if it's not real clear, you can see the pinfire cartridge hanging out with the loading gate up. And you can also see where the, the hole goes to put the pin out of. Fire works and looks. If you find any of these, you might want to buy them. They're probably worth quite a bit of money. S and W Model One. Um, if they couldn't get a Remington or a uh, Colt, this was also used. Um, it's a small caliber rimfire, not real strong. The 44s were definitely had more power. 36 as well. Um, but the reason I put these in is they you did see them on in service and the way they load. The next picture will show you how it loads. Uh, brass frame, kind of cool, octagon barrel, but that's how it loads. It breaks up the wrong way. It opens up the hinges on the top and the latches on the bottom and the cylinder then comes out and can be loaded. And uh, anyway, that's the Smith & Wesson Model 1. That was a rim fire like your 22s. Okay, now we're into rifles. 1861 Springfield, the most widely used rifle of the war. It was relatively accurate, it was good, um, reliable, worked well. These guns are pretty tall. I mean, they're, they're no stubby. They're, they're long. And then you put a bayonet on them and now they're as tall as you. They're, they're a big gun. Here you can see the side lock. You can see uh, pretty much everything, the ramrod in the end. Out here at the end we've got a ramrod. This would be a muzzle loader. A muzzle loading rifle means it's rifle. They made muzzle loading muskets which were smooth bore. And again, at the beginning of the war there were no guns. You brought what you had, run what you brung. Get what you can find and a lot of what was in the arsenals were muskets. They were smooth bore until they got rolling good. But this happened to be a rifle gun, and uh, it shot the mini ball. But that's the difference between musket and rifle, is the rifle in here. So smooth bore, rifled bore. These were made in the north, um, but if the south could get a hold of them, they'd use them. Uh, they have no problem with that. It took the same ammunition. The Enfield, imported from England. Um, in the beginning of the war, they imported a lot of stuff, both sides. They imported iron, they imported saltpeter, they imported 
anything. Uh, they traded, the South traded cotton for it, uh, the North. The North was kind of stuck up on this a little bit. Uh, they did not want to have a fancy gun. They said, no, we're going to build our own. But the South said, we'll take any gun. So they imported Enfields. The North used them as well, if they could get them. Again, don't be picky. Pick up what works. So this was also a, a common weapon on the battlefield. It, too, was rifled and shot the mini ball. The Sharps. This is a falling block. Sharps was made in America. It was American-made, and this was a, one of the great stepping stones of, of gun building. When you pull this lever down, it's like a, uh, this lever comes down around a, a circle, about 90 degrees down, and this block right here will fall down, opening up the breech. Now these we use the same cartridge, the same paper cartridge as the ones you stuck in from the end. When these first were designed, the seal on that block was not real good and it blew powder in your eyes. The seal was a little bit lame. Okay, so they worked on sealing up the powder or the charge. But you could put that paper cartridge in from the back, and when you raised the block up, it actually sheared off the back of the paper cartridge and exposed powder. And then when the percussion cap lit it, there it went. You didn't have to bite the end off or tear the end off and pour it in there. You put the whole paper cartridge in and closed the lever, sheared off the back of the paper. Okay? Some of them even had that nitrate uh, linen, which would burn without shearing it off. These guns were also designed to be muzzle-loaded. It didn't matter. If this lock, if this got seized up on you, if the breech block got seized up or crudded up or dirtied up and wouldn't run anymore, you could load this from the muzzle. Put a cap on and keep right on flight. But this is uh, a great move forward, and they're still making them the same way today. Sharp's company up in Montana is still making these rifles. During the war years, that's pretty much all that Sharp's did was make weapons for the war. They had very little commercial sailing. They did good business. Their sales fell way off after the war stopped. The same, same kind of gun that was used during the Buffalo days, the Buffalo hunters. I've got written up there Burdan sharpshooters. Uh, Hiram Burdan had a had 2,000 sharpshooters. That's the what they called snipers back in the Civil War. They were basically snipers. They called them sharpshooters. But uh, I remember Dan had a, uh, he put trials out. You had to be able to shoot good enough to earn one of these rifles. If you didn't shoot well enough, you didn't get one. You used the, the other, you're, you're down the line. Okay. But he had 2,000 people qualify good enough to, for his expectations, and uh, they had to build these up. They uh, tried to build 2,000 rifles. That was the order in a month. And that's kind of a, think back. We take things for granted. There was no electricity. You couldn't work by night unless it was by lantern. How in the world do you make 2,000 rifles without electricity, with no lights? You had to be near a creek for water power. And uh, you're going to produce 2,000 of these in a month? Wow, um, that's cranking it. That's that's doing something. And today we're we're complaining if our TV don't work. But they're building these by the thousands with nothing to work with. <laughs> kind of a little bit of history there. This is a Sharps carbine, um, shorter. Rifle means long. Carbine means short. Uh, cavalry was issued uh, carbines. There were probably about. Eight or 9,000 carbines made versus the 2,000 rifles. The carbines outnumbered the rifles quite a bit. It's the same design, just a shorter barrel, shorter stock. And they were, they were popular with whoever could get them. They were a very good gun. Whitworth. This is an English import. 
typically used by the South. Very accurate, very well made. You can tell by the checkering, it, they took pride in their work. Uh, the, when the North started making their Springfield 61s, all they cared about was lock, stock, and barrel were of decent quality. And we all have heard the word lock, stock, and barrel. That's a gun term. We just talked about that. Oops. There we have the lock on the side, and we have the stock, and obviously we have a barrel. Give them the whole lock, stock, and barrel. There it is. It's a gun term. Just a nicer shot of the nipple and the hammer. This is a single trigger. Um, you could get them with double set triggers. Some of these uh, sharp shooting rifles could be ordered special order. Ah, scopes 150 years ago. Imagine that. That is a Confederate sniper rifle or sharp shooting rifle with a very early scope on it. Kind of. So we haven't done anything new lately. Whitworth ammo. The Whitworth had a hex bore, and here you can see the hex bullets. Um, it says right down there on that box, it says hexagonal projectiles. Um, and that's what it was about. Besides, it was just a nice picture, so I threw it in there. They, the bullets were actually hex to fit the hex bore. And there's a hex bore. And why it's funneled on the end is it starts easier. This is a true muzzle loader. This loads from this end. So it has to have a little bit of a start so it doesn't shave your bullet all to pieces. So it's a chamfered hex hole. The uh, Ordnance Department tried to give Burdan's 2,000 uh, crack shots these rifles right here. Colt revolving rifle. It's like a big pistol. It was not trustworthy. It broke. It's cool. Looks nice. Um, Burdan pitched a fit, threw a tantrum, and said his guys deserved better. Um, so he got, he got the sharps eventually. But they, they sent him these because they, they were in inventory, and they said, we will just send them down there and let uh, Burdan's men use them. It's got to be better than a muzzleloader, right? Well, he sent them down, and they did not happy. Um, they traded these in for, uh, for the sharps. Now, moving forward, what we've got is we have repeaters. Uh, the 1860 Spencer, a 5656 is the dimensions of the case. It actually shot a 52 caliber bullet. Um, the later ones were 5650s, which was, a, again, a dimension of the case. Uh, but this was a true repeater. You open the lever on the bottom. It took magazine, it took the cartridges out of the buttstock which is the wood in the back. Um, there were seven cartridges in there. This piece right here was based in your magazine. So your magazine fit into the back of the butt stock and it fed up through there and it went in. And every time you cycled the action, the U.S. would get a fresh round. Every time the U.S. cycled the action, the U.S. would get a fresh round. And it would be the action, you would get a fresh round and it would be the empty case. You had to cock the hammer manually on a sensor. It would run another shell in. Um, group. Here's a little bit of a color on how that works. The lever comes down. Um, this is how the sharps would come down as well. The lever drops, and one cartridge is ejected, and the live cartridge is then fed into the chamber from the breech, the breech end. Cock the hammer, you're ready to go. So it sped it up quite a bit, and you had seven shots on hand. Carbine meaning short. It was a short rifle, worked well on horseback. This is not a nice picture. Notice the uh, the box at the top. That's kind of like an arrow quiver. You could put 8, 10, 12 of those tubes in this quiver. That was a rimfire gun. 
now we're into Henry's. Um, Henry was the predecessor to Winchester. The Winchester lever actions you know today, this was uh, prior to them. This, this is uh, the start of the new. That's just a patent. Um, notice the date, October 16, 1960. It was coming along about the same time. This one actually cocked the hammer itself. You didn't have to reach up and cock the hammer back. And there's a nice full color picture of it. Uh, they started out making the, the uh, receivers out of copper, then went to brass. Copper's pretty soft. Brass is a little tougher. Okay. Pretty basic. But again, that's a long time ago. They used a lot of files and they used some cutters and it was rung by water and um, I give them credit. I wouldn't want to do that with a chisel and a file. That's, uh, but that's the, the guts of a Henry repeating rifle. They were very sought after if you could afford them. The problem was they were pretty expensive. If you could get one, you were lucky. Ah, we're into machine guns now. We're moving forward into machine guns. The Gatling gun, uh, made in Michigan, it was designed by a doctor. So the Lamotte and the Gatling gun were both designed by doctors. Uh, their, their thinking was, at least Gatling's uh, thinking was, if he made war so horrific, it would be over sooner. So he created what this, uh, this, this gun that would just end warfare. Okay. Um, it was a whole mass of barrels in a circle, and you cranked the handle, and it just kept rotating and feeding down. Every time it hit the top, it fired another round, or every time it hit the bottom, it would fire another round. And uh, that's pretty much how they came. Drug them around with a horse. Uh, that was the first machine gun. There's one with a stick magazine, and you can see the crank handle. So you just wound on that handle, and it was just ran away. It ran about 600 rounds a minute if it didn't jam. 600 rounds a minute is about like an AK-47 or somewhere down along them rounds. It, it went as fast as a, a modern day machine gun. And since it had seven barrels, it he attempted to keep the barrels cool by adding more barrels. Okay. There's the muzzle end and all the barrels. Only one of them fired at a time, but they were all either feeding, ejecting, loading, cocking or firing. There one was they were always doing something. And we have not gone far in 150 years. The GE Vulcan cannon, which is on some of the aircraft in the military, and also the Dillon minigun, we are still using minigun technology. It's not cranked by hand anymore, but we, uh, we put an electric motor on it and make a little better feeding system for it. But we are still using the Gatling gun design 150 years later. And these are still on our aircraft today. Okay. Okay, the cartridges that these guns used, um, this is artillery. Uh, we're going to get into cannons now. Kind of the same deal. You can see all kinds of stuff here. We've got wooden sabots on the bottom, uh, stuff to push balls out. They had solid ball, they had grape shot, they had canister shot, and we'll show better pictures of that. But they pretty much come with powder in the bag underneath, the far left. That's a powder bag, and then they've got a wooden block. Right here, you've got a wooden block under here, and then you've got a, uh, this is a shell, this is an explosive shell, and then on the bottom of it, they would tie this sack of powder on the bottom. They tied that on there, onto this block, and then the ball would be housed by that. Okay, that's an explosive. There's another block, and they tied them all on. There's grape shot. have to load the bag of powder all at once. It was tied together. There's a canister and an exploded shell. Canister shot, there's their bag of powder, and that can up there held balls. Ball bearings, lead bearings, whatever you could find. Balls. Like a big shotgun, like a big snake shot. 
Okay, that's what that was. That was about a that was about a 12 pound snake shot. Pretty awesome. The bottom was an exploded shell. That's an iron case with explosive in it, and then it turns into like a grenade. Those were time delayed or on impact um, when they exploded. They had time delay balls back then. Uh, they also had on impact explosives, but they packed that iron ball full of explosives and ball bearings and all kind of stuff. It's pretty ugly. Grape shot. Grape shot, those are all balls. And what they would do is they'd load that wooden platter in and they would stuff that down a cannon and away you'd go. You just had this horrible mess. Well, what you've got is a big shotgun if you tip it down. It was good about 200 yards. If you tip it down, you had a great big shotgun. And it was, it was not good. And I'll show you the picture next one. It shot that whole mess. That's another type of grape shot. It shot that whole thing out. And it was like a big, ugly shotgun. It was, uh, it was, <laughs> I wouldn't want to be standing on the other end of it. But that's another type of grape shot. And there's loose grape. There's what they're shooting at you. Golf ball size, various sizes of, of iron balls. There's an exploding shell along with a solid and then the mini balls in the bottom. Mortars. Three different kinds of artillery. We've got mortar, um, howitzer, and then the cannons, the, rif the rifled longer range stuff. And that's how they, they did that. Mortars were typically short range. Their trajectory, their, their bullet path went up high and came down. If you had to shoot behind a wall or land one on the deck of a ship, you don't want to come in straight on it. You want to launch it up, come down in. And that's what mortars were, high trajectory, relatively short distance, okay, short barrel. It went up and it came down behind the wall of the fort or whatever you were shooting at. Bronze Napoleons, why is it green? You're going to see green ones and black ones, and they designate them as that. Green ones and black ones. Well, the green ones were bronze, and they corroded. That's why they were green. They molded. Anyway, <laughs> whatever. Okay. Um, the limber is actually the cart in front of it. You hooked your horse to it, and you had your ammo box, and you had a cart, and you could drag your cannon along, and that's, that's a uh, bronze Napoleon with limber. Napoleon was a howitzer or a mid-range gun. It was a smoothbore. We had smoothbore, and we had rifled cannon. The mortar was smoothbore. The Napoleon was smoothbore. There's an iron one. There's a black one. That one was made of iron. That's why it's black. Just some little uh, numbers here. The typical um, six-pounder. Now, the six-pounder, that's PDR. That's what they abbreviated pounder with back then. Six PDR means six pound. That means it shot a six-pound projectile. It shot a six-pound. They also classified them as in inches. That was a three inch diameter. So you've got a, about a three inch diameter projectile. So they classified them two different ways, inch and in pounds. A three inch bullet projectile was about a six pound gun. The whole cannon weighed 800, 900 pounds. So you could drag it around with a horse. It worked pretty good, it had to be mobile. And that was just why I put that one up there. 10-pound ordnance. They liked the ordnance rifles. The ordnance were rifled. Uh, they, were, they were a very good gun, really appreciated. They liked them. 10-pound 10 10 projectile. So that one and the Napoleon. Napoleon um, the Napoleon probably did more damage throughout the war than any other cannon. It was easy. It was smooth bore. It was good to load. It worked. And if you tipped it down and shot grape shot out of it, it was a great big shotgun. So it worked well. 
10 pound Parrot. This is a rifled cannon, and you will notice at the back, when they started going rifling, the pressures boosted and they started bursting barrels. They started blowing things up because the pressure started to grow. They put a steel band around the back. or rifled projectiles, the rifled loads. Okay. Um, with rifling gave you distance. These were a longer shooting gun, but back then you have to remember, you could only shoot as far as you could see. They didn't do you a whole lot of good to shoot 15 miles. You can't see that far. So you were limited by how far you could see. Okay, you can see a mile, you can see a half a mile, but mostly you know, anything out to 1,000 yards, most of the fighting was anywhere from two to five, 600, somewhere in there was the norm. But this was a rifle. The Parrot gun was rifled. Here we got a 12-pound howitzer. Howitzer is mid-range. Mortar was short range. Howitzer, medium range. And rifled cannon, longer range. And you kind of got to keep that in perspective. Long range then was not long range now. Another picture of a howitzer, mid-range. Now we're getting up in weight. The 12-pound howitzer, 700 pounds, and if you get over there, the 24-pound. There we got a 24-pound howitzer, uh, 1,300 pounds. It gets up there. They even made them bigger than that. 32-pound howitzer, a 32-pound ball or a 32-pound projectile but your range is getting up 1,500 yards. Okay. Now we're getting into really, really big guns. See the band on that parrot? That's a parrot at Charleston. This was used mostly in ports, shoot ships. Um, it was big stuff. And that big band on the front, the band is five inches thick. The Confederacy made these, the North made these. The difference between the North and the South was the front of the band of the Southern guns was angled and the Northern guns were vertical. But that held a lot of pressure. They weighed a lot. And there's another parrot. That one's on little tracks so they could pivot it at a port or over top of a river or a waterway. Look way over to the right. That cannon weighed almost 27,000 pounds. That is pretty big, and it fired a 300-pound projectile. So put a 300-pound ball in there and huff it out over the river. I mean, it's, it's going. Um, about 40 pounds of black powder. You take a dog food bag of powder, throw it down there, and put a 300-pound bullet on the top of it, and there you got to... A big, a big parrot rifle. Armstrong also made big guns, and there you can see it protecting a bay or a harbor. Um, Armstrong made both breech loading and muzzle loading cannons. This one, that one, you can see the the uh, the breech opens up. This is on a ship, so the back end of this one would open up, and you can feed it from the back end. But those are those are pretty big, pretty big weapons. 300 pound Armstrong. 300 pound projectile is what that means. Okay, that's pretty much all the pictures I have. So those are the guns they used mostly. Um, there's always more. Um, but how this all came to be? 19th century ordnance and war changing events. Rifled barrels probably had, I don't know, I wouldn't want to say the most to do with changing the war, but if you think back of when they lined their soldiers up in a big row and they all trotted across the field in a line, that was done for several reasons. Number one is how do you talk to your soldiers? You could do flags, you didn't have any radios, the officer rode up and down the line on a horse yelling and screaming, um, they had to get people relatively contained. Problem with that is, is when you go toward the soldiers, toward another line, 
Um, it's okay with a smooth bore gun because the range was typically 100 yards. If you were much over 100 yards, it was only luck if you got hit with a musket. With rifling, now we're shooting 900,000 yards and you're hitting things. So lining up in a row and going towards somebody that's going to shoot at you was a really a, a, a deadly feat. I wouldn't recommend that. Crawl. Do something. You're going to get shot. Um, so rifling changed everything. It should have changed everything, except some of the leaders decided that, ah, we're going to line up and we're going to do it like we always did. Take a deep breath and go toward that cannon. Run toward them people shooting at you. It was not pretty. They got shot up pretty bad. It was almost a mile across at, uh, at that last charge, at Pickett's charge. It was almost a mile. Okay. They started putting in artillery on you. Then when you got within 1,000 yards, they started shooting rifled rifles at you. And if you lasted to get close, you were lucky. That was not a good, that, that was not a good bet. Not good. So rifled barrels changed warfare a lot at that point. It lengthened the range of their rifles. Sharpshooters. The Sharps rifle that we saw a picture of, the falling block, those were used by Burdan's sharpshooters. And uh, General Longstreet had 30,000 soldiers underneath of Little Round Top. And they got within 100 yards of that hill before they got pushed back. Okay, The rebels had Whitworth rifles, and they started picking off officers. They were doing a good job of fighting. Uh, Burdan had his 200 sharpshooters at the top. Some say 300, whatever. Two, 300 sharpshooters at the top. If it had not been for those guys at the top, the North would have had a big time problem. They fired 10,000 rounds in 20 minutes through a Sharps single shot rifle. 200 men, and I'll call it 300 men. The numbers vary. 300 men, 10,000 rounds in 20 minutes held off Longstreet's charge on a little round top, long enough that General Meade could get his reinforcements in. The North was shooting into the sun. They didn't get good shooting in. Um, Longstreet snipers got down into what they call the Devil's Den, which is a bunch of big rocks, and they were 500 yards from the end. Okay, so they were just shooting away, shooting officers, and doing a good job. Okay, um, artillery blew them out of their rocks, but it was very, very close. Okay. Um, Breech-loading rifles, again, that's where that's coming from. You can load faster, you can hold off more stuff. 10,000 rounds of smoke, smoky black powder. I bet they couldn't see nothing. Colonel Raines' powder mill, uh, that was state of the art. They did not run out of powder. They kept things going well for them. Um, that, changed, that changed that deal a little bit. They didn't run out of powder, they made good powder. Manufacturing in the North, if it hadn't have been for the manufacturing capability of the North, they'd have probably got spanked. It probably would have not been good. Okay, so the manufacturing in the north was a big changer for the north. The ability to have powder in the south was good. And this always kind of impressed me. Famous last words by General Sedgwick. They couldn't hit an elephant at this distance. He got shot by a rebel sharpshooter at 800 yards below the left eye. So they sniped him at 800 yards. Men, don't be sissies. Get up here and fight. And there he is, standing there. Pow. They pegged him right in the head. So, in 1863, 1864, they were shooting accurately at eight or 900 yards. Pretty good deal. That just always interested me. So, logistics was an interesting deal. Money and all of this good stuff. So, that pretty much concludes my... Uh, my speech on that. Is there any questions that I didn't cover, maybe? Short questions? Yes, sir. How do you load a 300-pound shell? <laughs> all those people standing there all had, no, they had, they had slings. I didn't put the picture in, but there were, there were pictures of slings that you could pick them up and pull them over and shove them in. Most of the big guns were in fixed positions, so they had fixed jib cranes or hoisters things. So, ending. Any other questions? Yes. As the technology improved and you have speedy rifles, the North seemed slow to adopt the new weapons. Was it money or was it the um, attitudes of the general? 
It wasn't necessarily money. What it was was ammunition. If you give somebody a repeating rifle, he's going to waste his ammo. And they had to get it to the soldiers. So they were saying muzzle loaders are slower to load, but they had to make sure that they made their shot count. So they, it was more of a body, how much ammo are you going to burn up? Yes, you got one? The canister was not a bomb, um, but the canister was just a whole bunch of shrapnel going at you, or balls. Um, the bomb was the one that had that exploded. They they put gunpowder into those, and then a fuse on the end, and then it blew up the cannonball. The canister was just used like a big shotgun. Okay. Yes. Correct. Yes, it was the powder end, and that's why they had, they said, hold, how did they say they do that again? Um, they had a specific way to hold that so that they didn't spill the powder when they did it. So they bit off the powder end and poured it down, and then threw some of the, powder, some of the paper away and then jammed the, the ball in on top of it. They tore the powder end off. Yes. Anybody else that I might be able to help? Yes, sir. We're talking about the size of Yes. Yeah, but it'll burn too fast and explode. If you don't slow the powder down, you get a spike in pressure and it won't hold it. So the bigger the cartridge, the slower that projectile has to start. It kind of has to go at it gradual and get it moving and then kick in the afterburner, so to speak. So big balls, uh, big balls of powder for big, big ones. Okay. Anybody else? Anything else? Pretty cool. Good. Well, I thank you for coming. Hopefully that wasn't too boring. Um, it was an overview. Thank you.